have gone. I am also a Toastmaster. I have been a Toastmaster for 23 years. And it shocks me that I'm still Toastmaster. You'd think I would have gotten it down by now. But no, the thing is, I'm in a wonderful club, Windy City Professional Toastmasters. And it helps me refine and tweak. You are never perfect. And so I love that club, as Press said earlier, he's a member too. My intent today, it's on leadership. So I'm gonna share some of my military stories, uh, boot camp, Iraq, Egypt. But these are universal lessons. And these are lessons you can take back to your club and apply them. Because you know one of the intents of Toastmasters is to build leaders, which is fabulous. Harvard Business showed that most people become a leader around the age of 32, but do not receive formal training until, 30, until 42, 10 year gap. I, having been in the military, started learning to be a leader at 18. So I'm gonna hopefully help fill that gap with you today. So what I, my intent, I want you to walk away with two things. First of all, I want you to walk away with some leadership lessons you can apply at your club. The second thing I want to walk you to walk away with are some maybe some more Toastmaster skills you can try. So how many of you are still in your first one through ten of the manual? Okay, at least three. Great. What I'd like you to focus on then is eye contact and <coughs> vocal variety. Notice how I use them. Now the rest of you who are more sophisticated, I want you to watch some of the storytelling uh, techniques that I use and be willing to try them. So come back with me to 2004. I'm working at Argonne National Laboratory. I'm an Army Reserve Colonel. I'm married. I have two teenagers. Now, that's an important point. Do not forget, I have two teenagers. <laughs> and three cats and a dog. Oh, yes, <laughs> at house school. The phone rings at 5.30 in the morning. I don't know about you, but when the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning, I get scared. I'm afraid somebody's ill or worse. So I picked up the phone with a lot of trepidation. Hello? What was a colonel from the Pentagon? Morgenthaler, we want you in Iraq. And I'm looking at the phone, I'm like, oh, Iraq. Two teenagers. Iraq. Two teenagers. Iraq? Of course, Uncle Sam, I'm there. And then I looked at my husband, because he's looking at me, and I go, good luck. Now, I set a low bar for my husband when I go off to these places. I, all I ask is that when I come home, both children are alive, and three out of the four pets. And he met it. So I arrived in Iraq, 2004. Saddam Hussein had already been captured. I ran all the public affairs for General Sanchez. The radio, the TV, the newspaper, working with the media. Well, Saddam Hussein was finally going to go in front of a very brave young Iraqi judge on his crimes against humanity. I pulled rank. I told my soldiers, I'm taking the media in. Now, the night before I'd gone over, I checked out the courtroom, very small courtroom. So I realized when I brought the media in, there was not going to be any room for me. And then I'm back in my uh, office and the phone rings. It's the United States State Department, which is strange because the State Department doesn't call colonels. The State Department calls generals. Generals then tell colonels what to do. So I had this gentleman on the phone. He's like, Colonel Morgenthaler, tomorrow for Saddam Hussein's uh, trial, we want you to wear civilian clothes. And I looked at the phone. I said, excuse me, this is war? He goes, yes, Colonel, I know that. We want you in civilian clothes. Condi wants you in civilian clothes. And I'm, Condi, who the world is? I go, you understand, I am in Baghdad, right? He goes, yes, Condi wants you in civilian clothes. And he finally said, who is Condi? He goes, Madam Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice would like you in civilian clothes. Who? Who are? <laughs> Luckily, being a, a woman who likes to have the opportunity to party, I did bring civilian clothes. Okay. 
you just never know when the opportunity might be there. So the next morning I, I dressed, I wore a long skirt, long sleeve blouse, you know, in respect to the Muslim culture, and my combat boots. Because I'm not ruining those boots in that sand. <laughs> so I escorted into the courtroom Christina Amakor, Al Jazeera, Peter Jennings, Al Arakia, Al Arabia. No room for me. I'm hanging outside, and a bus pulls up. Now, I never imagined Saddam Hussein would arrive in a bus, but the bus pulled up. Two guards and Saddam Hussein got off the bus. He was shackled, his wrists and his ankles. And as he walked by me, he was trembling in total fear. He never even noticed me. And as he walked by, I thought, oh my gosh, you think you're going to die today. You think you're going to have your hearing, get your sentence to be executed today, because that's what you do. Oh, what are you going to do when you realize you're not dying today? So they took him into the courtroom. I then moved into the hallway. I'm trying to eavesdrop. Even though I don't speak Arabic, I'm going to try to eavesdrop. Well, and at some point he realized he wasn't dying that day. And he started screaming at the judge. What he was going to do to the judge, to the judge's family, everyone. He was coming back into rightful power. And that very brave judge finally kicked him out. He came out a totally different man. He was top of the world. He showed them. And then he saw me standing there in my skirt, my blouse, and he checked me out. He gave me what we used to call the hairy eyeball. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so. So I started staring back at him. And I'm using every nonverbal Toastmaster skill I have. And I'm looking at him. And I'm thinking, no way, dude. And I'm also remembering what General Sanchez said. He said when he looked into the eyes of Saddam Hussein, he saw pure evil. I don't know what pure evil looks like, so I'm looking. Pure evil, pure, pure, uh, dirty old man, yeah, you got that. <laughs> so there we are, we're just staring, neither one backing off, and finally, he barks out something in Arabic. The guards burst out laughing. They're taking him to the bus, and I'm like, whoa, 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 what do you say? Kill her. And that's when I learned he used to execute people for staring at him. Now, I don't know what your religious beliefs are, but I believe I know where he is today. And I am thrilled to be with you all to share these leadership lessons. And as we say in the Army, hua, hua. So what I want to do, I wanna, I'm going to use the format. I actually use the format hua, by the way. Military lingo means do you agree? And when you answer hua, it means I agree. I've made it into an acronym because one of the things press has taught me was when you can, make something into an acronym. And this took me a while. I came up with it, press. <laughs> so what I'm going to cover today is hua on leadership. Heart, optimism, opportunity, abilities, and hands. And if time permits, we'll throw in an extra one, humor. But let's start with heart. Heart is the most important thing as a leader. There's two things as a leader you provide. It's hope and it's how. Heart is your hope. Heart is it's about you, it's not about me. 1996, I went over to Bosnia to help work with the, uh, as the peacekeepers, separate the warring parties, Serbs killing the Muslims, killing the Croats, killing the Serbs. This was the first time I had left my family for any extended time. My daughter was four and my son was six. And I headed over to Bosnia, thrilled to be on a grand adventure. Well, after a while, after watching a lot of mob scenes and other incidents, I started wondering, are we really going to end 1,500 years of ethnic hatred? Am I really doing the right thing being there? Or am I just a bad mom leaving my children? 
So I'm walking down the street of Sarajevo, I'm in my uniform, my eyes are on the ground, and I am wondering, am I a bad mom? Am I messing up my kids for life? And all of a sudden, my hand was picked up, and this little old lady kissed it. And I looked at her and I thought, oh, I'm here to save her. And I stood up tall and I looked around, and I saw boys playing basketball boys who had hidden in caves and cellars for four years. And then I saw a cute teenage couple on a bridge flirting. And I thought, ah, I'm in the right place. I am the right person at the right time, in the right place. My kids will be okay. And that's what heart is. You, each one of you, is in the right place at the right time. You are the right person to give heart to other Toastmasters. Toastmasters is one of the warmest clubs, one of the most diverse clubs, I think, in the world. We can truly make this world a better place. Each one of us can touch and save lives. And so the first thing you bring to your club is your heart. Now the O in HUA, optimism. Doesn't matter how terrible things are, if you are the leader, you provide hope. I was, over, I was working in a blizzard, and we had flooding, and I couldn't find my son. The Des Plaines River had flooded. My son and my, my daughter and my husband were out of town. I was in Springfield running Homeland Security. I could not reach my son in Des Plaines. He's a teenager. I kept calling, I kept calling, and yet I had to keep performing and saving the lives of others. So when I would step up in front of the media, I provided hope, even though within my mind, I am sick with worry. And finally, in between the interviews and the events, I managed to get my neighbor. I'm like, Chris, I can't find Neil. Can you go over there? So he waited over there, went into the house, went upstairs, Neil is sound asleep. <laughs> this is how people end up on a roof during a disaster. So Chris woke him up and got him out of there. But you have to provide that optimism. And so I want to give you an exercise to do, to show no matter how things are falling apart around you, and this is a great exercise before you walk on stage for any contest. So everyone, stand up. Look up at that ceiling. Look up, straight above you. Now, while you're looking up, stand as tall as you can. Keep looking at the ceiling. Now, give it a big smile, huge smile. Beautiful ceiling, big smile. Now, as you're smiling, keep smiling. Lower your face and look at me. That's optimism. That is strength. And no matter what you're facing, every one of you is a leader right now. The other part is, don't have it about me, oh, I hope I'm okay. Have it about, I am so glad you're here, I like you. So I want you to turn to each other and just say, I like you. Thank you. Take a seat. Before you go on stage, before you place the press, before you face the boardroom, you do that exercise, you look out at the audience and you think, I like you. And now you are going to step forward with hope and optimism, even when the world is going to hell in a handbasket. I had to use that one over and over again in Iraq because I got stuck with the Abu prison scandal. I was the spokesperson about those seven soldiers who tortured prisoners. Seven disgusting soldiers who I was very, very pleased they went to prison. But I had to show that optimism and that strength every time. And that got me through it. So O is optimism. And you bring that to your club. You don't whine, you don't complain. You bring in that attitude as, we're all gonna walk out of here better, we're all gonna make this world a better place. Because you are the right person at the right time in the right place. All right, our next O is opportunity. Now, first of all, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are here on a Saturday, aren't you? Yes. Take the opportunity. 
any, any crisis, any element of change can be your opportunity. When I was over in Egypt, 1997, I, my unit and I were sent to Egypt for big military operations. I was totally jazzed. I was going to work for a two-star Egyptian general. How cool is that? Not cool at all. As soon as he met me, he went, Morgenthal, you're a woman, I'm not dealing with you. I'm dealing with major Healy. And I thought, oh my gosh, how do I overcome what? I don't know, 3,000, 5,000 years of this? Mm. I went back to my office with Major Healy and I thought, well, I'm not giving away my power. So I looked at Major Healy and I said, whatever the general wants, you clear it through me first. And he was shocked. I'm not a micromanager. I wasn't going to give away my power. This was my opportunity. The general was on the top floor of the building, the fifth floor. We were on the bottom, no elevators. And his soldiers, their English, we just couldn't understand on the phone. So when the general wanted something, he would send a private down five flights to get Major Healy. Major Healy would go up five flights, and the general would say, Major Healy, I'd like you to do this. And Major Healy would say, Sir, got to clear it through Colonel Morifaller. Major Healy would come down five flights, and he'd go, Mate, he would explain to me, I'd go, yes, go ahead, tell the general, that's fine. Then the Major Healy would have to go back up five flights. I don't care what your nationality is. If you are a general, you do not want to be kept waiting. One day the private came down five flights, came in and said, Colonel, the general wants to see you. And as I ran up those five flights, I thought, I taught an old dog a new trick. <laughs> And I thought, I don't care what he asks. He had no idea what an opportunity he had. I don't care what he asks. I am saying yes. So he made his request, getting your unit to the, oh, yes, sir, right away. And he and I had a good working relationship after that. I could have sat in the corner for three weeks and have done nothing. But that's not a leader. A leader seizes the opportunity. One of the opportunities you have in Toastmasters is to compete. And this is hard. It took me three years to win the, uh, the humorous speech contest at district. Three years. The first year I didn't even place at area. Second year I think I came in second at division. Third year, I blew it. I ran away with that shot. Take those opportunities. Contests are really going to get you out. Press is just back there nodding. Yeah, it is going to get you out of your comfort zone. And you will be a much more polished speaker, whatever the results are. So, oh, opportunity. You are the right person at the right place at the right time. Whoa. Whoa. A, abilities. Everyone to the club preparing something. Now, how many of you were in the press's uh, presentation shortly, besides press? <laughs> One guy asked a question on action within a speech, how long it should be. It really depends on the story. So as I tell this story, you'll see this is probably, uh, definitely longer than 30 seconds. Okay. I was one of the first group of women in ROTC when it was an experiment training us with men, integration. The men were totally unhappy. They thought women coming in were going to sissify the military and communism was going to win. My junior year went off to officer boot camp. And there was 83 women, 500 men, and 50,000 soldiers. And the men went after us women with a vengeance. I was a butch. I was a bitch. I was a bimbo. And that was just the letter B. But I hung in there. And then one day, I learned, and my team taught these people who didn't feel there was a place. We showed them something. It was obstacle course day, and I have got to show you what this obstacle was. Our goal was to go from A to B within 10 minutes, get your whole team. The obstacle facing us was a wall of barbed wire. Rip your flesh and close barbed wire. Like that wasn't enough. The ground beyond the barbed wire was painted yellow. If you touched the yellow, you were contaminated, your team flunked. The Army only gave us two tools. 
One was at the far side, over at B, was a plank of wood. And the other, suspended above the barbed wire, was a rope. We're standing there. I had a great squad of guys. We're looking at it like, huh? Are you kidding me? I wanted to say, can we just sit down and take a cup of coffee? Because obviously this is not for real. <laughs> Luckily, one cadet, Bruce Gorski, he got it. Big guy. He had joined the Army to get out of the mine, uh, working in the mines. He got it. And he looked at that barbed wire and he said, okay, this is how we're going to do it. I'm the big guy. I'm going to throw myself on the barbed wire. Mortifeller, you're the little guy. Now, as you can see, I'm not a little guy. But compared to those guys, I'm oh. And I love that name. Of all the names I was called, I love little guy. <laughs> so, let's get back to the story. Morgenthaler, you're the little guy. You're going to run up my back. You're going to grab that rope. You are going to swing. You are going to land on the far side. See that plank of wood? You're going to pick that up. You're going to throw it to me. I'm going to catch it. I'm going to lay it on the barbed wire. And then, guys, we're all going to run up. Do it. Who up? And I said, no. They should not be press. They should be who they are, but with all their skills and strengths enhanced. So they too can get their passion out and find out why are they in Toastmasters. There is a reason. And then help them achieve that and then go beyond it. So A is for abilities. Then we have H is for hands. Get out there, roll up your sleeves, and just do it. In Bosnia, one day, uh, we had terrible communications. And the colonel, uh, the general actually turned to me and said, Morgenthaler, we've got an operation going on up north. They're confiscating weapons. There might be some violence. I want you to be my eyes and ears on the ground. Who up? So I got a convoy, and we convoyed up to this military uh, fortress. And after I checked in inside, it turned out the colonel and his troops had already left to confiscate weapons from this village. The village, of course, we knew would be very upset because it made them vulnerable to attacks. But there's nothing I can do. He'd already moved out. So I'm just hanging in the communications room, listening to the radio traffic. You know, just kind of, mm -hmm. And this young officer comes up to me and he says, ma'am, there's four Bosnian colonels, and they want to meet with you. And I looked at him, and I said, um, <coughs> I don't work here. He goes, I know, ma'am, but you are the highest ranking officer. And I looked around, oh, I guess I am. I said, okay. Well, ma'am, it's more than just four Bosnian colonels. 
with them are about 200 really angry people. And they've got like these big sticks and these big rocks. <laughs> I'm looking at them and I want to say again, excuse me, I do not work here. Uh, that's not in my job description. Or couldn't somebody else do this? But I thought, all right, all right. Let's see, put my weapon on, put my Kevlar on. I'm a colonel, I'm a leader, stand tall, stand confident. All right, I can do this. And as I started to step out of the fortress and I saw the four colonels and I saw the 200 angry villagers, I felt like Frankenstein with the villagers. They had sticks instead of pitchforks, but they were coming for me. And I'll tell you what I thought as I stepped out. I thought, Lord be with me. And I stepped out there, standing tall in confidence, inside scared to death. And those four colonels, their reaction was, huh? They didn't know what to do. They never expected a woman officer to step out of there. They really didn't know what to do. And so I took that impromptu moment to say, oh, gentlemen, I understand why you're here. I understand your concerns. And when you start to follow the Dayton Peace Accords again, we'll be more than happy to give you your weapons. Thank you for coming out and sharing this beautiful morning with me. Have a good day. And I stepped back and I closed that door. <laughs> and they left. And I knew right then, sometimes the best man for a job is a woman. <laughs> And I knew I was the right person in the right place at the right time. And I'm very glad I had those Toastmaster skills. Table topics, do them, compete in them. You just never know when it might actually save your life. Hua, hua, hua. So those are hands. So what we've got, we've got about, uh, let me cover humor, and then I want you guys to throw some ideas back at me on how to use your heart your optimism, your opportunity, your abilities, and your hands, and humor. So humor. First of all, one reason why I love Toastmasters is that most clubs, you walk in, and no matter how your day has been, you're going to be sitting there and laughing. You are going to have a great time. The humor speech contest, I think, was one of the hardest contests, and I think it's the most fun. Participate in it. Now, humor is a weapon that can actually save lives can lower tension, can bring back humanity, back to Bosnia. We were in a village. There had been a lot of bloodshed. An old man had been killed that day. I had seen his body being taken off the mountainside. The village, the village was deserted. It was too dangerous for people to move back in yet. There was too much killing going on. So I had been there because of the earlier incident, and I was there with my soldiers, and all of a sudden we saw villagers trying to sneak back into the village. So I stepped forward with my troops. I said, you can't go home yet. I understand you want to. It's too dangerous. Well, the leader of this group hauled back and he spat on me. And all of a sudden there's this spit going down. I've never been spat on. And my soldiers pulled out their weapons and locked and loaded on the villagers. I thought, no, nobody's dying over me getting spat on. So I looked at the spit, and I did one of the hardest things I've ever did in my life. And I looked at it, and I went, <laughs> did you see what he just did? Oh, now I gotta clean my uniform. <laughs> Everyone started laughing with me, except the guy who spat on me. They all started laughing with me. Now, we were no longer that lean, mean, green machine. We were just people in a village. And I was able to convince them to go back and stay safe. Humor, powerful weapon in your arsenal as a leader. And once again, I was the right person in the right place at the right time. And every one of you is. Final story. Saddam Hussein. That wasn't my finest moment, meeting Saddam Hussein. That might have been his finest moment, meeting me. Don't know. 
My finest moment was right before I retired, 2006, full colonel. I was asked to go to a fundraiser for veterans and to present a saber to Sergeant Dusty. What they didn't warn me about was Sergeant Dusty's disabilities. Sergeant Dusty had been over in Iraq in 2003, and a terrorist had lobbed a grenade at him and his convoy. He caught the grenade and threw it back, but not in time. He lost both his hands. The first hand, he had enough of a wrist to have a prosthetic device, prongs, not his right hand not enough wrist, so he just wore a little blue silk covering over it. So here I am, in front of hundreds of people, and I'm to present this heavy saber, this heavy sword, and I'm looking at him, and he can read my face, because I'm looking at him like, how do I do this? And he looked at me and he said, ma'am, don't worry, I've got it. So I took that saber, I stepped forward, I put it in the prongs. He then took his stump, he pushed the saber down, and he saluted me. That's the finest salute an officer can ever receive. Help take care of our veterans. Many are coming home. Toastmasters may be something that can help them tell their stories and begin their healing. Hua. Hua. All right, so we've got 15 minutes. So what I want you to do, let's start brainstorming. I started off with H is for heart. How can you bring heart? How can you show it's about them and not about you and your club? I know it's uh, early in the morning on a Saturday, but what can you do to show heart in your club? Let's, yes. Ask them why they are there and how those masters can help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. Yes, and the why is fantastic. They might not know the how. You might have to tell them the how, how it can help them, but they might too. They might know it too. So but don't be surprised if they go, well, I don't know, my boss sent me. <laughs> Otherwise, you can so, show heart in your club. Yes, press. So you can also give encouraging words to newer members, especially the guests who are afraid. And you see a new guest or somebody's going to give his first speech for the first time. Go to that person and say, hey, you can do this. It's yeah. fun, it's fun, go up there. I've been in that situation, I felt myself nervous, but you need to share your story because you never know who's there, how you can help others. Yeah, and, and you make a great point. Let them know that nerves are good. Being nervous, I'm nervous before I speak press, I know you are. If I wasn't nervous, I would be boring because it means I don't have any passion for this. So to me, nerves is just that energy that you throw out. Let them know nervousness is good. Um, definitely meet every person who walks in that room. Um, I went to one Toaster with Masters Club. I was looking for another, a second club maybe. And um, no one really greeted me. And when I left, nobody followed up with me. And I thought, oh, well, I guess they don't need me. You know, that wasn't hard. So what are some other hearts you can show, other ways? You can show that it's, you're there to help them. Yes, oh, and your name? Mary Jo Arlington Heights. Great. We have this two meetings a month. The second meeting of the month, we all go out for beer after. And we make sure our guests know they're invited. And I can't believe how much that contributes to the congeniality of the club. And, and I, most of us go around and make sure people who are less comfortable socializing can come with us. I'll give you a ride over there. Wonderful. It really helps a lot. And that's what leadership is. It's inclusive. Yes. I, I think it's really important, you know, really, especially when new people come to the club, kind of show true interest for them. Ask them a question. But if you ask them a question, look, have that eye contact and listen to them at your heart. Yes. What, I mean, whatever you ask them, but just ask them at your heart. Show the interest. And listening. Sometimes us Toastmasters talk too much. That's one thing my husband says whenever he comes to one of these things, like, oh, yeah, you guys like to talk. <laughs> you know, and following on what they've said, it's, uh, what really amazes me or impresses me is when I go to a meeting, and it's only the second time I've been there, or somebody else, and then they come back and say, welcome back, and they remember something from having talked to you, like, oh, you're from the Blue 
Cross Club or something like that. And when you do that in your own club when somebody new comes in, and then the second time you show that you really remember something about them, it really uh, reinforces the fact that you were listening the first time and that you're welcome in the member. That's excellent. I love that. Yes. You are glad they're back. You remember them. <coughs> Wonderful. Any other H's? Okay, let's go to O for optimism. How do, you, how do you get your club to be even more spirited than it is? What can you do to really to help people realize that this is a journey that A, should, can be fun, and B, they can achieve? Yes? In, if they do not give a speech as expected, mm -hmm. do not pull them down, mm -hmm. but give them encouraging words as part of the evaluation saying these are the two or three things they could have done differently to improve the speech. Yes. Um, I have blanked out sometimes. And so, and think of somebody much newer to this. And so let, letting them know, hey, here's how you can improve it. And don't worry, we've all been there. Yeah. Other ideas on increasing the optimism. Yes. Uh, I think it's very important when, when you're leaving for a meeting or whatever else you're doing, when you go, you go with intention to bring something, to, to improve people, to bring the energy, and just kind of be fully, bring yourself fully into the meeting, and just things will happen. Wonderful. I think that's your, your, your attitude, uh, to bring that up. Yeah. And, you know, oh, and back to your point, too. When, so, when you should keep in mind, of course, where everybody's starting. Some people start here, some are up here, but really emphasizing Hey, you know, you have grown so much. Yeah, sure, that happened. You have grown so much. Other ideas on optimism. I like your, by the way, I like your going out and drinking. That, that, that we can do under humor, too. <laughs> Press. So one of my favorites for all of us in those methods is giving evaluations. And especially if it's a first icebreaker, that's a really key evaluation. Because you never know how your words can really turn that person off Toastmasters. The person may not give a show again. Yeah. So always emphasize more strengths. I give when it's an icebreaker, I'll give, let's say, three strengths and just one, one idea. Ooh, for I like that. That do three to one. one. Yeah, do not kind of uh, put too much pressure on them and say, oh, I'm, you know, this criticism will come, self criticizing talk. Prevent that, give them three uh, strengths, just one idea for improvement. Wrap it up with good job. I'll see you next time. Yeah. Excellent, that's a great one. Yes. Jill, I think optimism um, is through the stars. Tell your stories. Um, mm. uh, there's a saying that that which is personal is very general. Most of us are not born co good communicators. Yeah. Most of us have to go through a long journey. Right? So if I'm starting as a communicator, I need to hear the stories that, look, despite all, the, all my deficiencies and all the uh, me forgetting what I want to say, despite all my fears, they will, they'll come to a time where I can speak like my DTM, I can mm -hmm. speak like Jill, right? So I think it's very necessary that we continue to tell our stories and the struggles we've been through for others to look at that. And one thing I found, you know, I tell my Saddam Hussein Pete story, and people are like, oh, I don't have a story like that. You don't need a story like that. Look at press changing a tire. What a common experience, what, in a way, a little experience, and yet, what a powerful message. So we've all have lived things. And it, I, I remember one guy, he did a humorous speech on just getting toothpaste out of a tube. I just hurt myself laughing. So it doesn't have to be the big story. It can be just like that old lady picking up my hand and kissing it. What a little story. But when it's told right. So yeah, so you all have wonderful stories. Every one of you have been through diversity. Adversity. Look at that. Um, on my book that's coming out in November, so let me be Jill the Shill. I mean, half my book is adversity. All the things put in front of me and how I figured out how to get around them and over them. So look at what has been a challenge in your life. Maybe it was just a mean boss. You know, maybe it was that awful teacher. Uh, and then how did you overcome it? Who mentored you to help you? Craig Valentine, I believe, is the one who always says, Go back to your mentor. You know, who helped you figure that out? And so once again, and then what, as you were saying, that then becomes the universal. Our stories are universal. 
Wonderful. All right, let's look at opportunity. Okay, what opportunities can you give yourself and your club members within your club? How can you give them more opportunity? Looks like you have an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Most people want to do something more than what they're expected to do. So when you see their interest, provide some suggestions and help them achieve them, I wish they feel good about joining this. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. Other ideas on opportunity? I, I love your idea about encouraging people to compete. I, I never looked at it that way. So it just made me think of giving a speech about that. Why would you want to compete? Because most people say, oh, I don't, I, it's hard enough to give a speech, much less compete. Yeah. So uh, that's really great. You really grow. You have to learn choreography. You have to have it tight. Um, I, back when they did the dramatic reading contest, I don't know if it, it was a fun contest. It was my first contest. I went all the way to district. And then I went 7 minutes 50 seconds. And the judges came up and they weren't supposed to, but they're like, you would have won. <laughs> did I ever make that mistake again? Never, ever, ever. <laughs> That's one reason why I have the timer. So yes, uh, it is a real opportunity. Well, it's like PLIs and conferences, it's a, it's a great opportunity, but there are so many Toastmasters out there who just don't come. Yes. What I, at least what I use, I try to, when I, you know, the clubs, when I talk to people, I try to bring that in, how much you can learn and kind of take for it. For and this just to show them, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, bring their awareness, this is what you have. You have a champion speaking, you know. Oh, I know. Um, and others, other champions. My club at Argonne, nobody had ever gone to a district contest or district meeting, so I went by myself, and that's when I was sitting in the audience for the dramatic reading going, oh, I could so do that. <laughs> and, and bring somebody from your club, and that's the wonderful thing, when your club pays the one fee, everybody can come. Bring somebody else with you. Make them, <laughs> make them see all the things we offer. I mean, like I said, this is one of the to me, one of the most hopeful, most diverse, uh, fun clubs you could ever belong to in the world. And then when you travel, I haven't done this yet, but I hope to do this, go to other Toastmasters, especially if you're in a town by yourself. You know, ooh, Tuesday nights, the such and such club, well, I'm gonna go visit. What a nice way to meet some other people. Yeah. Okay, any other ideas on opportunity? Sometimes, you have to force them, by the way. Leadership roles, sergeant, start with sergeant of arms. A lot of people are gonna sit back and want, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Sometimes you just have to ask them face to face. We really need a sergeant of arms. I'll be glad to help train you. We'll get your training. We need you. That, that, right? Not just, hey, we need a sergeant at arms. That does not work. We need you. Yeah, yeah. See, that's exactly what happens. Yes. Yeah, you have to do it, don't you? Yeah. Okay, that was, um, how about abilities? Uh, let's, well, let's, let's do, um, you know, we've got only two minutes left. Let's do humor. How do you bring more humor to your club? Yes, Chris. Share your funny experiences, especially when you have done something not so smart. <laughs> And you really do. You always want the humor. Kind of at yourself or as general life in general. Yeah, I, I find that if you're like if you're the Toastmaster, if you're leading that meeting and you start out with a funny thing happened to me on the way to this meeting, the rest of that meeting is light Oh, I like that. Because people are already in that elevated mood. Yes, they're already laughing. And do you guys have joke masters in your club? Do you do that? Yes. Good. Good. Yeah, we don't at Windy City. We only do evaluations. But I miss that. I miss the joke master. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, if you would like my business card, I've got it. If you are interested, my book comes out November 11th. Um, but you can pre-purchase now. But if you'd like to take a flyer on that, both of these are available. And everyone, have a great day. You are the right person at the right time in the right place. Ooh -ah. Ooh -ah. I saw press.
breathtaking.